It is my privilege that we can uh, start a new study, a new Bible study about stewardship. And today we have the undertitled The Influence of Materialism. To be able to answer the question, what is a good administrator, what is a good steward, we need to know the requirements given uh, for a steward. So every steward can only manage the property of someone else. That means own property cannot be managed as a steward, and as an end, the administrator cannot have personal property. If you have personal property, you can never be an administrator. Now we have in Luke 14 a story that will show us this. Luke 14, starting from verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether we have sufficient to finance it? Lest happily, after he hath let the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold, it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and he was not able to finish. Or what? king going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousands to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousands. Or else, while the other is yet of great way off, he sendeth an, em a, an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all, that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So, a disciple or a steward is the same thing. So, to be a disciple of Christ, there must be first a realization that I have nothing personal. I must realize that whatsoever I give, it's not from me. Whatsoever I ever I manage, it's not my own property. Now, people think, and we think, because we are born in a deceptive way, in a deception, that we have possessions. And so we think our mother, our father, and even our life is our own, which is an absolutely impossibility, which is an absolute deception. That's why Jesus says, a, the first thing a disciple needs to realize is that he has no personal property. If he does not forsake all that he has, that means if, if he does not give all that he has, if he does not understand that he has nothing as his own, he can never be my disciple. I hope we get this first requirements to be an administrator, to be a steward. You must know you manage the property of someone else. But an, a steward also needs the ability to perform the task. So he must have certain capacities to perform the task. He must be able to do a counting if uh, it's going to work. And then he must have the ability to be responsible to the owner. So we will look to all this. But first let us a little bit look to the basics of creation. When God created something, he created everything with a purpose. And he created the thing according to the purpose it was made to do. But everything that he created, the structure, cannot work by itself. It must work by means and needs. And he stabilized or he fixed a source where the structure needs to take 
in order to give to fulfill the purpose. These are things that are unchangeable and they are determined by the Creator. Now, just a short example. This is a watch. Why do we have a watch? What is the its purpose or task? It is to display the time, to show us how much time it is. Without it, if the watch does not function, how can it fulfill its purpose? So the watch must function, but in order to function, it must have a source of power, and that source of power is, in most cases, a battery. The purpose and the function are inseparable units because you can never fulfill your purpose if you not function. We will see that life is not a purpose, but if you're not alive, you cannot fulfill the purpose. So, when man was created, Adam and Eve's purpose or mandate were plainly made. God put him on earth, and his purpose was maintenance, the life on the earth. Man was the only link of the world to its creator. He was supposed, he was the one, not only supposed, he was the one that the, all, the whole world, the, our earth, would be fixed in him. As God creates and everything in this universe is running in a circle, it starts in God and it finishes in God. And everything hangs on this circle. And even our earth hang on this circle, on God, but the one that was made the administrator of all was man. He is the only link of the world to its creator. Through him, the life and everything on earth should be preserved and going forth. From him, the power should come. So God gave the power, which is his love power of life, righteousness, truth, and so on. And the source is God himself. And so Adam and Eve had to take from God. They had to be the administrator that take all the means from God and they give them. And the animals make the same thing and the plants make the same thing. They take in order to give. And everything on earth must do this. And at the end it comes out a fruit which goes back through Adam into the circle. How God has made everything to function. This was Adam's and Eve's purpose for creation. They were not created for God's sake. They were created for the need of this earth to fulfill the task. Every little life, everything that is on this earth was connected to man. And he should be the king. That's why God, the Bible describes him as to be the king of all this. That's his mandated purpose. For this, God had created him out of two elements. He made him out of dust. He formed him and gave him the breath of life and that he became a soul. He became a life. But in this soul, the dust transforms into body and the breath of life transforms into a spirit. Both are very complex elements of functioning now. While before they were just no functioning units, now they are very complex functioning units in the soul. But they are dependent. They have need. The body needs chemistry and electricity that comes from the spirit who needs to exercise love, righteousness, truth, freedom, security, peace, well-being, knowledge, happiness, and so on. And if all these needs would be fulfilled, then the spirit or the soul would be satisfied and the body would be healthy. So man was created out of two elements so that he should fulfill his purpose. Now, let's see what these two elements can and what they cannot. So, this is the body and this is the spirit and they are only functioning while being together 
as the soul. But their function is distinct. Only the spirit can act for himself. The body obeys the commands of the spirit. Everything my body does is just fulfilling the commands of my spirit. The spirit cannot be forced to act. He only can command himself. So the body cannot command himself. He can be forced to action. He actually only obeys commands. Only the spirit can think, fear, feel, taste, smell, and decide. There is no capacity in the body of spiritual things, thinking, feeling, or deciding. Only he can move the body. The body has no power in itself to move itself. Only the spirit can have relationship with God, humans, and animals, and the body cannot do that. He can only deliver information. He has no relationship capacities. So, what are the abilities that God gave man to fulfill his task as a steward? He gave him a body and a spirit. And in his spirit, he has the capacity of self-government. There is no one that governs the spirit of anyone. God made the spirit as an entity that only can govern itself. The spirit is an impermeable uh, substance, so to say, that only can act for himself. God has not made the spirit ever to be governed by him. No, the spirit has self-government. It must, everything physical that is governed, you say a word and it does, it happens. But the spirit must govern itself. So that's why he must have capacities. He must have a capacity to think. He must have discernment. And he must have a capacity to decide. How can he govern himself if he doesn't have these capacities? So we have seen the spirit has these capacities. Without this, he cannot be a steward or an administrator, a manager. He must have morality. He must know for whom he does what he does. And he must have responsibility so that he can give the owner, the one that has given him the stewardship, that has given him the means also to take an accountability from him. So he must be responsible. For all this, he must have these abilities. Now, how does man think and how does he decide? How does he govern himself? That was one of those things that I'm very thankful for God that he helped me to understand as a medical doctor as I worked in my practice that I came to understand that how humans take decisions, how their mind functions and which is the thought that governs all the functions. What's, where do thoughts arise from? Where does the ability come to decide and to think? So God helped me to understand it. Actually, it came out of an error. I came to understand the truth. My error was that I was thinking that diseases come from different causes. Like tinnitus, that is a sound in the ear, comes from another cause than someone has dizziness or when he has throat pain or whatever dysfunction I found in the body, I thought, let's put all these people that have the same dysfunction in a group so to see what do they have in common so that we can see the cause of each disease. And so I looked to the common denominator in each group. And by God's grace, I came to an understanding that the common denominator in every group was one thought. So it did not matter what disease a person had when it came from his thinking. Now there are causes by you can be poisoned, you can be burned, you can be uh, uh, frozen. Those are causes where your body can become sick or in dysfunction. But we don't talk about those. We talk about those that come from the mind because we want to understand how the mind, how the spirit functions. And all those that come from the mind, and there are more than nine out of ten diseases, come from one thought. 
So if you can rule out the physical things, then it must be this one thought. And that one thought was the thought of loss. So he said, how can it come that people have all these diseases? But that answered also my question that some have all of these diseases. They have the tinnitus, they have the dizziness, they have the throat pain, they have the cancer, they have the diabetes, they have the depression, they have it all. And I say, how can them come they have it all? Because if all comes from loss, from one thought of loss, then some have greater loss than others, and so they have greater diseases than others. Or they value their loss greater than others. And so, in every case, loss was the cause of the dysfunction of the body. And so I understood that man must put all his information that comes unto him in three categories. Let's look. Here is the cortex, the brain, and above him we have the spirit. And the spirit has a conscious and a subconscious part, we know that, and we have five senses. We have the eyes, the hearing, the feelings, the smell, and the taste. Now all of this must come and come to the spirit. They come through the body and they must be put in three categories in the subconscious, in gain, indifference, and loss. Everything I see, I put either in gain, because, oh, I like it, it's, it's a gain, or, oh, it doesn't matter, or it's a loss, I don't look to it anymore. Or what I hear, I put either in gain, in indifference, or in loss. What I feel, it's either oh, I feel well, it's a gain, or it's a loss, or it's neither one of them. Gain, indifference, and loss in the smell, in the taste. Oh, this tastes good, it's a gain. Or, mm, well, not really what I... Or, ah, it's terrible, it's a loss to put that into the mouth. So all information and impressions that men get from outside, they must put down in only these three categories. While indifference doesn't play a great role, it's the zero line, but gain and loss plays the major role. Is it the gain or is the loss? Everything. We think like this. We cannot put it anything else. And so God put these three categories and he gave man two decisions so that he can govern himself. So if you put everything in gain, then gain is that what he must achieve. And for this God gave him a decision that is yes. And by the yes he makes the electrical car. He puts things into action. So this is how he must achieve the gain by saying yes. All decisions are just yes and no. And so he must avoid loss. The indifference doesn't play a role. So he must be always avoid loss. That's why God gave him a no. Jesus explains this very perfectly in the Sermon on the Mount when he says there in Matthew 6 from verse 19 that we must have a heavenly treasure, a treasure that is a gain, that is eternal. And there where our heart is, there is also our treasure. And he said, every, your decision, every word is yes, yes, or no, no. Anything else is from the devil. All our decisions are just yes and no. You see, Adam had to govern himself. And he had to put something higher than another things. So, a loss is not necessarily something that is in itself a loss. It's just in this moment, I have this more important than this. This is a gain now, and so the other one might be later again that what I now consider a loss. So a loss does not mean necessary to be a loss. It's just it's, an, it's a lower gain. 
It's a lower game. That's why Adam was put in a perfect garden. There was nothing for him to lose. But to be able to decide, he had to say, hmm, do I take an apple or a pear now? And in a moment that he decides for the apple, then the apple is more gain than the pear or the peach or whatever it was there. And so, what, but in another time, he sees the peach and the apple and he decides, oh, the peach is more gain. So he has to govern himself and God gave him this self-government by gain and loss, giving him a yes and a no. So what do you, what, for what do you say yes? You cannot say no. For what you say no, you cannot say yes. So it's very simple the way God created us in his structure to function. And this is how we make the electrical current. This is how we take all our decision. It's just yes and no. Everything else is not possible. You, Whenever you take a decision, you must say yes to something and no to the other one. We can't, you cannot say at the same time to the same thing, yes. You must take it in an order. You must say yes the next minute to what you said no now. But you say then yes to that and say no to that other, what a minute before you took. So it's only yes and no. Now, God made us individuals. And we must understand gain, indifference, and loss what is individually and what is not individually, what is uh, set for all people. Now, the question of what is a gain and a loss and how much is the gain and the loss is individual. We want this, some, they see this as a gain, the other sees the other, the other tastes this, so he sees this as more beauty than the other thing. The one says, oh, this is much, the other says, oh, this is less. So. That's very individual, that's very subjective. God gave that. Everyone can go as he wants. But even in the what and the how much, much is the same. Many people have the same what and have the same how much because they match with their desires. But in the end, it does not matter because this are given to every individual to be individual not um, the same. We should not have the same taste. Uh, we have the same taste, but not everyone tastes this so good as the other one tastes this good. You see, that's individually. And that is the nice thing that God gave to everyone to be individual, have his individual part in what he sees as a gain and a loss or as a difference. But what God has set is the how. How do I get to gain and to loss? This God has set for all humans to be the same, and this is set by the law. This he governed, he said, how you reach, reach the gain and how you avoid the loss, that's how I created you. So individually, we the what and how much and all this, but the how is set by the Creator. Let's look what he set for a gain. He said a gain is to give. And the loss is not to give. That's the opposite, or to keep. And here is that what we must understand in our human being, how we were made. We were made always for the gain. But if the gain is giving, then it's fantastic. We have a parable in Luke 19 of a man that goes into a far country and he leaves his servants and he gives to every servant a talent. He gives him a piece of money. And now, after a long time, he comes back and takes the steward into an account. And look there, first he asks, has made one of one talent, one of one dollar, let's say, he made ten. And the owner is very happy, said, oh, you have been gaining, you have been a steward for gain, so you was faithful in the little things, now I give you ten cities to govern. So, every administ every owner 
must gain. And an administrator must bring gain to the owner. It cannot bring loss. Or, have you ever seen, would you ever employ a person that brings loss to you? No. Every em employer takes people to work for him to bring him gain. That's nothing bad. That's how God created us. To want to be rich is not a bad thing. It's how God made us. It says, where your treasure is, your heart is also. That's God given. Everything in heaven goes for the gain. Adam was made to make gain. To give all that he got from God. He had to take from him and give. Gain is to give. Now, here is the servant, the steward, who gives an account and he brings. And God, the owner of the money that gave him to him, says, Wow, well done. That's how I expected you to work. To make one of one penny more. The next comes and he has five. And, wow, the owner is very happy. You made one of one, you made five. That's gain. And then comes the one that took the money and put it in a napkin. That's how you should, in, in German, it's, it's th that napkin is something you have to uh, take off the, the sweating. You know, when you work, you sweat, and then you need a napkin to take that sweating off your your uh, front, uh, and so now that you, he put that money in that napkin where he should have worked with and hid it and gave it back. But that was a loss. The owner of that dollar was not happy. He said, why did you do this? And the answer said, oh, I know how you are. And you, you know the story. You can read it in Luke 19. But the point is that he took that dollar from him. And he gave it to the one that had ten. Because he said, to him that has, it will be given. Why did God give him the elevens? Because he knew he will use them for the gain. He will give it to work. He won't keep it for himself. So, God made us all for the gain. There is nothing evil in gain. As long as the how is to give. And loss is the opposite not to give or to keep. You see, have you made your account? It says here, in Luke 14, do you know how much it costs to be a good steward? We must know it is to give. That is gain. And as long as gain is giving and loss is not giving or keeping, there is no danger for selfishness. There is no danger for anything to go wrong. So, what was changed in Adam through his fall in into sin? When Adam disconnected from God, something changed. And we'll see those changes. But on the end, it changed. The gain became to receive. Even though it's set by God to give, it cannot be changed to receive. But now he thinks receiving is the gain. And he thinks when he not receives or something is taken away, then he is in loss. And now it's obvious that he is in a distortion. It's obvious that now he does not calculate things anymore correctly. And he becomes that what he should not become. He, he now uses the things for himself. Let's look to it as a repetition a few details about man's purpose, means, and source. This is man. He was created for the purpose 
of maintenance of life on earth. He was the link. He was the administration, the manager for the whole earth that everything should run well. For this, he had a need to act. He had to take in order to give. He had to think how to fulfill his purpose or his task. God knew that this man cannot do it by himself. He needs means in order himself to function and to be able to fulfill the purpose. So he gave him love and right. He gave the spiritual power. He gave him food, water and air. That's the physical, the chemistry that he needs to put it. He gave him materials and tools so that he could work with nature. He gave him relationships. He said, oh, Adam, alone, it doesn't make so much fun to be an administrator. Do it together. And by going together, they should multiply and have children so that they fulfill the purpose together. And he gave him appetite, passion, and sexuality. All those that he should have a satisfaction by giving them and fulfilling his purpose. Those were means. And he gave him life so that he can do all this. All this means were given to Adam to fulfill his purpose. And of course, the only source that was there for all of them was God. So he took from God all those means and needs that he had to function himself and to fulfill his purpose. And everything went well until he became changed in his heart about what is the gain and the loss. How do I get? Not the what, it, how do I get? When gain is to receive, a resource or a means becomes a goal. And so man is stuck to self-destruction. Let's look to it. Love and righteousness are means that we should exercise it. But now we expect it. We say, if you don't do me love, if you don't do me righteous, I die. So a resource, a means becomes a goal becomes the purpose. Food, water. Now people do feasts. They eat and drink. And out of what was given them as a means, now it is a purpose. It's a goal. Let's, let's do it. Let's have this, this feast. It's nothing wrong in feast, but it's wrong that we use the food and water as the purpose of the feast and then comes of course we have material means God gave us tools he gave us a house he gave us cars he gave us many many things that we might use them for the best administration but we see in the means a goal if you don't have a house you think you're not fulfilled because you see in the house your fulfillment. You see in your tool that God gives you to work. You see the fulfillment in the money you achieve. You think they are that what you have that fulfill your, your happiness, your purpose. But that can never fulfill it. Then relationships become a purpose not a means anymore. Then we think marriage is all we need to be happy. We don't see that marriage is not a, a purpose. Marriage is just a means by which together to have children. And our children are not our means. They are not ours. They are God's. We should have them for multiplying and making the earth richer. More gain on earth. But our relationships are just a means. They're not a goal. It's a terrible, terrible thing. Our appetite, our passion, our sexuality, they now become central. We don't see the use of them except for us. We don't see the use of them in order to give. We, they become, if I don't have it, then... I don't have what I need. But it's not so. 
a means become a purpose. And in life, look to the philosophy that science have about life. They look to the earth and all they can come up says, the purpose of life is life. Or better to say, survival. It's the most stupid thing to think that the purpose of life is life itself or survival. Survival never is and never will be a purpose. It cannot. Disease proves it. We were not made for life's sake's sake. Life is not a purpose. Life is a mean. But in our error in which we are born, in which receiving is the gain, everything that is a means for us becomes something to keep. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Friends, we must understand keeping is loss. We have never received any of the means that us has given, spiritual, material, and the relationships around us, to be kept, or better to say, together. Oh, the more relationships I have, the better. Because I see in relationship the purpose. That's why it's so important that we understand Jesus in Luke 14. Here come the people after him. They, they come after him and there went great multitudes with him and he turned and said unto them. So here they are, they are all in behind of him and he turns around and says, do you know why you come after me? Do you know what it costs to you? You must realize that you have nothing. You must give up. And he, he says this, you must hate it. Yes, we must hate to make out of our father, our mother, our spouse, our sister, our brother, a purpose. And our own life to make a purpose. We must hate it. To think the mother is mine. And if I don't have a mother, what purpose in life do I still have? People are so upset when they think, oh, when my mother dies, what will I do? Well, is your mother your purpose? Is, are you on the world for your mother's sake? Why are you living? Why are you alive? To take a means as a purpose. Hold tight. We hold tight on our relationships. We hold tight on our children. We hold tight on our passions, our sexuality. We hold tight on our life. This is the error. That's why we are the slaves of materialism. We think in this matters, in what we have, we find our purpose. And Jesus says, no, friend. You owe nothing. You have nothing. There can never be a purpose in your means. But even in our deception, we go even further. We made out of God a purpose. We think worshiping God is the purpose. We don't see that worshiping God is just the taking of the means that he gives to us in order to give and to fulfill the purpose. We are upside down by thinking again is to receive. Let's look to the rich young ruler. It's also the story here in Luke 18. This man, is, this, this story makes me very much thinking. It just is good for everything you want to point out. Because everything in this story is so revealing to us. This man is a religious person. He comes to Jesus because he sees that Jesus is somehow different. And he sees that something is lacking to him. He is one of, you say, say of these multitudes that come after him. And he comes to Jesus and says, 
Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Because you see, in the selfish nature, eternal life is a purpose. But eternal life, in reality, is only a means. So he wants eternal life. And Jesus says, well, yes, eternal life is there if you keep the commandments. And he gives those commandments that shows our purpose. It's to give. You're there to do something. To keep, to not to keep, to, to give in order that life should be maintained on earth. So he gives them that part of those six commandments that talk about the giving, the purpose. And he looks in and says, well, all this I have done from my youth. Now, Jesus should be happy and said, oh, well done then. You're ready to, you, you have eternal life. But he knows the deception of this young man. And he says to him, looking with love into his eyes, he says, there is one thing that lacketh. Sell everything you have. Forsake all that you have. Sell everything that you have and give it to the poor that you might have a treasure, that you might gain, that you might fulfill your need for gain. That you have a treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Why could this young man not do it? Because the Bible says he had many riches. So for what purpose did he have the riches? To keep them, to gather them, to hold them tight for himself. He did not understand the law of life. He was living in a pure deception. Everything was running around himself. And what the means he had, they were not in order to give. That's how we live today as well, friends. It doesn't matter the religion you practice. In reality, you live for this. In order, instead of for this. That's why I hope that we will study these stewardship lectures. That we might understand. We are in deception. There was a lady who told me that she just had to take all the, the stuff out from her mother after she passed away. And her mother had two flats and she just put everything there and she, she kept her letters from her youth. Every little thing was kept in those two flats and in the basement and in the place above in the storage everything she kept even she says the 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 things where you put into the um bags little bags when you took the bags out they fall apart because they were so old but they were put back there everything was kept friends do you want after your passing away or whenever someone comes to, to throw things away or to, to find that you kept everything. We have things not to keep them, but to give them. Our life is there to give. Our appetite, our passion, we use in order to fulfill our purpose. Our relationships, we use in order to fulfill our purpose. They are not the means in itself. We are not there to keep them. We should hate to keep them. That's why Jesus says, if you do not hate your father and your mother, your wife and your children and your brother and your sister, that's relationship. That's the center of all. We have put our relationships in the center as a purpose. And by this, we die. People get sick because of relationships, because their relationship is a purpose, 
not a means. We are there not for us. We are there to give. But if a purpose, if a means become a purpose, then the purpose cannot be fulfilled anymore. Then the means stalk you. If you think in achieving you have the purpose, then of course you can never achieve the purpose. You cannot come to the purpose and you will die unhappy. This is why people are unhappy. Even though they have all things, they have achieved their great material things, they look into their, their, their rich things and like the rich young ruler, he had all that, but he was not happy. Why? Because happiness is when you throw it out. Happiness is when you give it. When you understood that you have nothing that you must keep. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath. That means he understands that he has nothing for himself. He has all to give. He forsaketh it all. He gives it all because that's the purpose. Then he can, be, can fulfill his purpose. But if he does keep it, he gathers, he holds tight, then his purpose will never be fulfilled. That's why people are so unhappy, even though they are rich. Even though they have many good relationships, they are still unhappy because they can all lose this they don't see that what what they do is what brings the gain when they sacrifice their life when they give it jesus says then you gain when you sell everything you have then you have a a, a heavenly treasure then tr the God sees, oh, this is one that I can give more so that he gains more. The more you give out of the means that you take from God, the happier you become. And that's your fulfilling of your purpose as a steward. We will study this more in depth in the coming, in the coming up lectures. But I hope we understand the first, most basic thing. We possess nothing. Everything we try to keep as our possession is a deception and will bring us not happiness. It will not bring us to be happy and fulfill our purpose. Because happiness and joy are only when you fulfill this, not when you Keep the things. May we understand this. We are here to use all these means to fulfill the purpose of bringing gain unto God, unto our Lord who gave us the stewardship, gave us the management of his own things in order to be multiplied. Because all in the earth multiplies. All is made for the gain. Amen.